You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Oh, cool. Um, so do you work at Rolls-Royce or do you just consult with them? No, no. Actually, I'm a professor in the uh, University of Nottingham, and I'm director of uh, Rolls-Royce University Technology Center in manufacturing and on-wing technology, meaning okay. uh, I am full professor at the university, and I'm leading the research uh, uh, center sponsored by Rolls-Royce. So I'm not I'm not an industrial guy. I'm, I'm academic. Okay, well, that's fine. And your fo- your focus is um, learning how to do the key, you know, to create the keyhole robots, or what's your role? So actually, I'm uh, my group uh, uh, develops robots for Rolls Royce to make in situ repairs of gas turbine engine. So in the way you can call it key surgery or any other ways, but basically we develop robots for in situ repair of the propulsion systems. Yeah, I spoke to some of the engineers there. That's how I got referred to you because I wanted to learn more. Uh-huh. It's it's really fascinating. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I have been just uh, probably you contacted my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. James Kell, who we were very closely. Yes, he's yes. A specialist. So, yes, 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 yes. Well, very cool. So, uh, so what? What's your um? So he mentioned last time that you're modeling some of the robots off, uh, you know, living creatures like snakes and. Um, Maybe caterpillars and things like that. Like, what what kind of locomotion do you want these robots to have? So, uh, our our field activity is basically uh, making uh, snake-like robots because that will enable us to get into a small port of the aero engine, and uh, uh, by this we can have access to uh, intricate uh, spaces where human intervention is nearly impossible. And uh, with these snake arms, we try to deliver different repair tools, like tools for removing the material, tools for adding material into the engine without being needed to, to dismantle this and take them off the wing. Yes. So that well, is our, our expertise, yes. Well, in addition to um, you know slithering their way into a, a hole or a port in an engine, do these robots, are they able to double back on themselves so they can come back out? Like, a, you know... Yes, yes, indeed. So we have uh, developed over the years uh, the mechanical structures, but also the control algorithm, which allows us to snake in, snake out of the engine. And uh, 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 right after, after, of course, first doing the inspection, performing the repair task, and after that, snaking out. So yes, we are talking about this robot you know, to, to uh, retrieve themselves. Mm-hmm. And how much of the body of the snake is used in locomotion? Like, could you have a... Um a hollow snake where you could feed tools through the center of it or keep them in the center and deploy them out of the head as you need? Yeah, so actually uh, the one of the lo- longest robots we have de- 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 developed, uh, it's o- over 1.5 meters with 24, 25 degrees of freedom actually, which is able to uncoil and advance through the through a key into a, through a keyhole. Mm. The whole snake arm, it has a, a uh, let's say um, delivery tube inside, or uh, uh, let's say a hull deploy any 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 facilities from inspection tools to material removal tools to material uh, uh, deposition tools. So uh, indeed, this structure allows you once you are with a snake in a snake, a snake uh, a robot in the uh, engine, you can deliver different uh, uh, intervention tools for in situ repair. Am I so, answering your question? Yeah, like what, what's an example of um, a job that one of these robots would do and what kind of tools would it need to do it? So, for example, we have developed um, 
uh, a robot to able to access part of the engine and perform, uh, uh, let's say, a grinding operation, meaning uh, a relief of uh, a stress feature of the gas turbine, uh, over probably, let's say, part of the engine. Imagine when engine runs on the tarmac, it might ingest some small stones and uh, little, little stones which can impact on the rotating element of the of the aero engine, this can probably make uh, small dents into the the rotating elements or uh, static elements. So in that moment, uh, after the inspection, you you need to uh, uh, make particular features, remove particular amount of material to release the stresses. So this kind of uh, incident they can be observed, and after that, a snake arm as ours can be deployed into to the engine and make these stress release features by grinding operation. So this is an example which we have done successful in one of our projects. So why why snakes? Aren't there other creatures like maybe a centipede or an earthworm or you know other creatures but, that would move easier? But uh, you, uh, what we have to uh, remember uh, this uh, what we develop is not only to observe things. Yes, we want once inside. We have to perform multi-axis movements to enable the end effector, which in this case, for example, is a grinding tool, to perform very accurate uh, tasks. So uh, that's why this kind of uh, uh, system can uh, give you enough accuracy in positioning the, the tool in multi-axis. Oh, I see, I see. But what about, um, why not make like a hybrid creature, a snake, where you have... Um you know, arms or pincers or something on it. Once it's inside the the engine, maybe those come out of the body of it, you know, and open out, and then they can, you know, not only can you turn the snake in, at the right degree that you want, but then uh, deploy arms. That's exactly to the do point stuff. I'm making. Okay. This is exactly, for example, it, it is exactly what you are saying. I'm saying these uh, snake arms are having multi degrees of freedom can orient themselves relatively to very complicated uh, uh, geometries of gas turbine engine and deploy the the, the uh, repair tool, being a grinding tool or depositing material and so on. However, we also developed uh, recently another type of robot when uh, we have two snake arms working in collaboration to perform a task. Yes. So this kind hmm. of uh, uh, tools we are talking about here. Yeah. Yes. So what are, what are the dimensions of one of these snakes? You said some of them could be up to a meter and a half long, but... How about the circumference? Yes, no, the diameter we, which uh, we can we have realized from 40 millimeters to at the moment the smallest we can uh, do is six millimeters. So very small uh, snake arms, yes, with multi degrees of freedom, yes. So from 40 to six millimeters. So with these, uh, all uh, of the, them, all of them, they having a hollow, hollow tube, yes. So you can you can deploy different different uh, intervention uh, tools, yes. Have you had to rescue some of the uh, objects? Do they, you know, get stuck or go dead, or are they pretty nimble and they don't get stuck inside the engines? Uh, actually, we had a, a project where we used this kind of uh, snake arm to, to uh, uh, let's say, to rehearse a, a case where uh, some object has to be retrieved. Yes, so you can have at the end of these snake arms, for example, yes, different gripping mechanisms which will allow you to to pick up objects, small objects, and retrieve them. Yes, indeed. Can you magnetize certain parts of the snake so that it can, uh, you know, let's say, unscrew stuff and hold the screw to it without dropping it? Actually, it depends now on what you put at the end effector of this snake arm. So you can have mechanized systems which and make uh, add additional degrees of freedom to perform such tasks. Yes, we have considered this aspect also related to gas thermal engine. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. So are these operational and are they in service or is this still at the conceptual stage? Now I cannot comment too much about the application at that and because I'm not the industrialist. You remember that we are a research center who is uh, helping Rolls Royce to develop such solution. Indeed, we have developed the same technologies going to different uh, technology readiness level and it's up to our um, uh, end user, meaning Rolls Royce, to comment at their implementation. But we are very close to implementation, yes. Yeah. So, all right, what, um, what's the next iteration once these, uh, these robots are in use? Do you, what's, you know, like, uh, what kind of refinements have you seen that you need to make on the devices? I think uh, 
it's interesting. Uh, I, I come from a, a mechanical engineering background. You know, I am a machine tool builder. This is how I started, and out of curiosity, I evolved towards this robotic system, which are actually not, nothing else than robots. How I would like to call them. And uh, from from our point of view, I think it will be interesting to develop more intelligent algorithms, and in such a way that probably an operator, an un, let's say untrained operator, can be trained in one day. We use these kind of robots, so I think we have uh, the the challenge for us for the future will be to develop intelligent algorithms, a control algorithm, and uh, good interfaces for the let's say un, untrained uh, uh, operators to to be able to to use them very easily. So I think that is the challenge, and what this is where probably our activity will focus in the future. Oh, that's right. I didn't think about that. So uh, these these robots have to be uh, controlled by an operator at all times, or are there things they can do autonomously? That that is very interesting. Quite a good comment. Actually, um, we just completed a project, very successful project. Probably you might have heard that it's called Reina, and uh, is um, uh, the concept of the the project was that uh, an unskilled operator will bolt the robot on on the engine, and the skilled operator will teleoperate the whole system. Yes, and uh, um, remotely. So it's basically uh, the specialist, for example, from the, from the company, will not need to 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 go to the place of intervention. It will need only a skilled operator to bolt the robot against the, the 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 engine, and from there the skilled operator will take control over the robot, including inspection, evaluation of the uh, the 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 defect to be repaired. Uh, machining operation, all this will be done remotely from probably thousands of miles away. So uh, this is another aspect of uh, or a new a new project which we just finished. So this kind of remote operation probably will be more developed in the future. What about um, AI and machine vision, so the robots can you know find their own ways to navigate in unfamiliar. Uh... Yeah, geometries. This, so, so, somehow the robot which I just mentioned is doing this because we have a probe going to the engine, uh, will uh, capture different frames and uh, detect out, uh, automatically where the defect is. And after that, the operator will be able to, uh, is able to uh, choose a strategy how to intervene to make the intervention. So it somehow is middle ground at the moment, yes. But you have, we have to bear in mind that autonomously, might not be the first priority of the industry concerned with a high safety standard. So we are not talking about here. We are talking about here about uh, repairing uh, propulsion systems which are uh, uh, safety critical for the safety of uh, transportation. Right. What about um, if you use the robot to go into a legacy engine and install, you know, little cameras so that when it's done. You could, you know, watch the engine continuously after that. Is there room in these designs for such a thing? We we, we have done a, a, a also a, a finished a, a project where um, we have uh, some cameras popping out into the gas stream and inspecting the the blades automatically, but not necessarily while the engine runs. But the moment when the engine, let's say, um, is spinning slowly on the tarmac. So imagine the aircraft finishes the flight, you know, and it's on the tarmac and the engine spins very slowly. In that moment, some, some cameras will, will uh, be extended or get, uh, get into a right position and start capturing images of the blade. So in this way, you can make an automated inspection at intervals, yes, between the flights of the blade. In this way, you can have information which can be built up and for uh, let's say monitoring the health of the engine yes so we have uh, we have done this kind of work but not this kind of images are captured when the engine actually is not uh, running you know it's just running on the tarmac slowly yes. so it's so are the uh, inspection are the newer um devices that are coming out now are they going to have cameras installed inside of them so they could always be viewed and You'll know when to service them, or I mean, could they have like these kind of robots on board, installed inside of them, so you can make repairs, maybe uh, you know, even in use, or is that impossible? Well, that is probably not possible because the engine operates of uh, hundreds of degrees, yes, 
uh, centigrade. Yes. So we are talking about probably when the engine is on the tarmac and uh, an inspection can be done, then you can make an intervention. So that's why I said uh, this inspection with the camera popping into the gas stream uh, is uh, uh, possible when the engines run slowly on the tarmac. So that this inspection will be done at intervals and then measures can be taken. Are, uh, are they seeing um, interesting problems that they didn't know existed before, you know, by using these? Are there any surprises? Actually, uh, it, it, for, it's very interesting that uh, sometimes for a, a single solution does not cannot cover uh, so the multitude of application we are facing. So it's uh, for us it's quite challenging every single time uh, when uh, uh, our colleagues from Australia come with a, a new program to be uh, considered. We have to think, uh, you know, out of the box every single time because although the the, the engine seems probably repetitive in the geometry. It's somehow repetitive, yes. Still, uh, the challenging uh, challenges to get into these spaces might be uh, different. So, although we develop these mechanisms, not they they cannot cover the multitude of uh, of the cases. So, actually, we develop solutions for different tasks to be done. Are the new engines? So all the time, uh, the Oh, yeah. All the time there are new new challenges, so that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Depending on what operation you want to do. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, are the new engines going to be designed with portholes in them to accommodate these kind of robots? I think that it's not uh, for me as an academic. It's not uh, an answer uh, a question to me to, to to give an answer on this. But I think that my where the industry might go to to get uh, easier access to particular zone of the engine. For repairs, yes, it might be, yes, but uh, that is an okay. uh, uh, question to be answered by Rolls Royce or my our colleagues. Have you been um, approached by anyone in the medical field, maybe to make, uh, you know, even smaller robots that would go inside of a, a living creature and make effects? I, 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 I think the medical industry, I think it's uh, quite well dominated by some big players and uh, coming into this field, but we have been. Uh, um, Contacted by other industries like uh, aerospace for fuselages, you know, to do to help them with inspection of fuselages, oil and gas uh, uh, defense industry. So, not necessarily uh, um, it, 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 people when they, when you talk about uh, snake arms, people immediately think about medical industry. But we are more, in, uh, uh, let's say, oriented towards industrial application. And I gave you some examples. You know? Okay. Yeah, I just figured there'd be cross pollination between the uh, the industries, and what you learn would help them, and vice versa. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, of course. Of course. There there are some uh, similarities between our industry and their industry or their application. But in our case, most of the time we have to carry end effectors, which usually are much heavier than the ins inspection tools the medical industry uses. So our designs have to be a bit. Uh, to enable higher stiffness of the system compared with a medical application. Yes, because okay. you usually you have to carry, for example, a grinding tool, which is a couple of hundreds of grams. So the, 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 the robot has to be much stiffer to, if you want to make pre very precise cuts or very precise intervention. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. What's, what's next over the next uh, you know year or two that's, that you're working on that's going to be uh, coming out? What can you say? So actually, uh, what I, what I, as I said, uh, for the next year, uh, we are trying to focus on uh, developing uh, better interfaces to allow these robots to be used by, uh, let's say, easier by the industry. And uh, and another aspect is to use artificial intelligence and uh, uh, to to improve the accuracy of our, our our robots. So in terms of positioning accuracy against the target we want. So these oh. are the two main streams which we are focusing. Because we come, my group mainly is from made of mechanical engineers where we also employ some good control guys. But uh, I think this is the direction where we want to focus. How accurate do you need things to be? I mean, are you close or is this still like a long way away? No, I think we are pretty close. That's why we have uh, uh, the, the industry, uh, the, our customer, observed that uh, they can start now developing further our system or trying to prototype them for implementation. So we are talking about uh, uh, precision of 
less than 100 microns. So it is it, it, not bad, you know, for uh, making in situ repairs. Yes. Are there any other industries that you're doing this work for, or is it exclusive to Rolls Royce? No, we, as we said, we discussed also with oil and gas, nuclear industry, uh, defense industry, uh, defense. So we are talking with a couple of other uh, uh, in, customers from other industries. Of course, uh, with uh, with a uh, uh, permission from our colleagues from Rolls Royce. Yes. Well, very good. So, what's the best way for people to find out more and maybe read articles or get in contact somehow? I think uh, they, they can contact us directly or uh, uh, see uh, see our uh, posting on YouTube and uh, also to to visit uh, uh, what uh, our colleagues from Rolls Royce posted on uh, Intelligent Engine because, because they did the work they refer there. It's, it's also uh, supported by us, so that might be a way. And also we have to acknowledge also uh, Innovate UK, which is our uh, main uh, funding uh, funding source, and GPSRC, our research council. So this is this is where uh, people can find more information about us. Well, very good, well, well, Dragos. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's uh, you know evening where you are, so thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's not a problem. Thank you, Richard. Have All a right. good day. All right. Very good. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.